Welcome all. My name is Jeff Shazinski, and I'm with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT. And I'm assisting to, in today's webinar on how NRCS technical service providers, TSPs, NRCS personnel, and conservation planners can support biodiversity conservation in organic production systems. We have three excellent presenters for today's webinar. Harriet Bihar is an organic specialist with the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Educational Service, or MOSES, and is a certified organic natural resources conservation NRCS technical service provider. And we keep using acronyms like TSP. So if you hear that, that's what we're talking about. Joanne Baumgartner is the director of the Wild Farm Alliance. She works on conservation, food safety, and organic issues, and, and is co-editor of Farming and the Fate of Wild Nature. Finally, Sam Earnshaw is with Hedgerows Unlimited and works on the design and installation of hedgerows, grass waterways, filter strips, and riparian restoration on farms as an NRCS technical service provider. And is also an NRCS technical ser service provider. Sam has, through his work, helped plant over 300 millions of conservation plantings on farms. Mm -hmm. He is author of Hedgerows for California Agriculture, a Resource Guide published by the California Community Alliance with Family Farmers. This webinar will cover how TSPs, NRCS personnel, and conservation planners of all types can promote sound environmental practices that enhance biodiversity conservation and improve the production capabilities of organic farms, ranches, wild, harv wild crop harvesters, and handling operations uh, under the National Organic Program regulations. Under, I'm sorry, uh, the National Organic Program regulations require the conservation of soil, water, wetlands, woodlands, and wildlife resources. Recently, the NOP modified their auditing of organic certification agencies, which is resulting in more scrutiny being paid to conservation by organic operations. This webinar will help you to learn how conservation professionals can instruct existing and transitioning organic operators to maintain and improve the natural resources on their working lands through the use of NRCS practices. NCAT, MOSES, and the Wild Farm Alliance are part of a three-year National Conservation Innovation Project with the NRCS to better integrate sustainable and organic agriculture production systems into NRCS programs and procedures. This webinar is the final presentation in a four-part series on becoming a technical service provider, TSP, for the Natural Resource Conservation Service. The three previous webinars can be found under the list of webinars at www.atra.ncat.org. As we proceed, we encourage you to type in your questions that is available on your screen in the little chat box. We'll have a, a Q&A session after the presentations where we will hope to answer as many of the questions as possible and time allows. You can also email the, presenter to, the presenters today as well as contact NCAT at our 1-800 hotline at the ATRA project, which is 1-800-346-9140, or if you're a Spanish speaker, uh, at 1-800-411-3222. If you didn't get those numbers, we will have them posted later in the webinar. Also, at the end of the webinar, there will be a very short evaluation which will come up on your screen. Please help us make these webinars better providing uh, this, this feedback. The 11 organizations who are joining with NRCS and, and NCAT in this, in this uh, National Conservation Innovation Grant uh, project are the Center for Rural Affairs, the Institute of Agriculture and Trade Policy, the National Sustainable Ag Coalition, the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Service, Organic Farming Research Foundation, the Virginia Association for Biological Farming, Florida Organic Growers, Kansas Rural Center, the Wild Farmer Alliance, Land Stewardship Project, and the Practical Farmers of Iowa. Finally, Joining us today to assist and answer questions at the end of the presentations will be Dana Larson, who is Acting National Rain Ecology for NRCS, based in Washington, D.C. So let's begin. Thank, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. Yeah, um, uh, I'm uh, director of the Wild Farm Alliance, and we've been working with organic farmers for years, putting in conservation practices. 
um, and we've worked with the NOSB and organic community for over a decade. Um, and I, uh, with my husband Sam Earnshaw, have been a past organic farmer. Hi, and I'm Harriet Bihar. I'm in Wisconsin. I've been an organic inspector for over 20 years, and I'm currently uh, the, an organic educator with Moses. Um, I am also an organic, current organic farmer with uh, contracts for CSP, both for crop and forest land, as well as past equipped uh, contracts. I am also, as Jeff stated, an approved technical service provider to write the Transition to Organic Conservation Activity Plan, the CAP 138, and I'm actively involved in writing a few plans right now, as well as being uh, involved with a variety of environmental organizations in my state and region. Hello, I'm Sam Earnshaw. I'm a TSP with agroforestry and land treatment. I'm working with Hedgerows Unlimited installing uh, conservation plantings. It's actually 300 miles, not 300 million miles, um, as Jeff said. <laughs> and then I'm working for, I did work for CAP, Community Alliance with Family Farmers, and now as a contractor. And Joanne and I were organic farmers for over 10 years. So biodiversity resource conservation activities can be implemented by organic farmers to um, help with production issues um, indirectly and also um, obviously help with conservation directly. What, when doing so, um, organic farmers meet the National Organic Program, which I'm going to, the acronym is NOP. Um, will meet those regulations to maintain or enhance natural resources of the operation. These include the physical, hydrological, biological features of the operation and um, address soil, water, wetlands, woodlands, and wildlife. Biodiversity conservation is part of the NOP's definition of organic production. And in the preamble to the rule, it says that producers must initiate practices to conserve biodiversity and to show compliance in their farm plan, which is called an organic system plan. And while all organic operations must conserve biodiversity, perennial systems must do, must do that, especially since no monocropping is allowed. So how has uh, biodiversity been implemented um, in regards to the rule? Well, in 2005, a suite of biodiversity questions were added to the National Organic um, Standards Board, the NOSB, the, um, their model organic system plan. In 2009, the NOSB added biodiversity conservation or conservation considerations to their materials review list. At that, in that same year, they requested that the USDA NOP comprehensively address biodiversity and, and the NOP has begun to do that and in um, 2011 they updated that organic system plan uh, suite of issues related to biodiversity and last year as Jeff mentioned they added the natural resource standard to their audit checklist used to credit organic certifiers and they also added that to their penalty matrix and so now there's much more scrutiny being paid to these issues. Still though that uh, NOP has a few more things to address before they, um, co they um, implement the recommendations of that National Organic Standards Board and one is to pro publish biodiversity guidance and we, Wild Farm Alliance, submitted a draft to them for their consideration with input from a wide variety of organic experts including Harriet Bihar. Um, we uh, also uh, expect the NOP to uh, begin providing biodiversity and natural resource education to farmers, inspectors and certifiers in the future. So um, there's lots of organic 
are lots of practices that organic farmers can use the, that um, NRCS provides. The Conservation Plan for Supporting Organic Transition, CAP 138, has short and long lists of NRCS conservation practices commonly used by organic farmers. To see the full list, you can go to the Tech Register website shown here. Um, and uh, we're going to be going through many of those today in the webinar. But organic farmers can use almost all uh, NRCS practices, although there's a few like the polyacrylamide practice that are not allowed because it's a chemical that is put into soil. Next. So um, as I mentioned, the natural resource standard requires maintenance and improvement of soil, water, wetlands, woodlands, and wildlife. And while the NRCS addresses a lot of soil and water issues, the list here is showing which conservation practices address wetlands, woodlands, and wildlife. There are a few more than what are shown there, um, but in general, that's about a quarter to a fifth of all the practices that NRCS provides can help address biodiversity issues. So when a conservation planner goes out to a farm and uh, to help a farmer address issues, um, NRCS looks at these um, issues in a, in a suite of resource concerns. They're, they're looking at it through soil, water, air, plant, animal, and energy concerns. And within those concerns, there are sub-resource concerns as shown to the right. For instance, if a conservation planner is out on a farm and the farmer says, you know, I've, I've lost a few acres of land next to my creek and I really want to stabilize that area, then that would be a soil erosion stream bank sub-resource concern. If the farmer also said that they cared about wildlife issues and really would like to in improve the habitat, that could also then be a sub-resource concern of fish and wildlife with inadequate habitat. So this is Harriet. Um, so as a conservation professional, you do get quite a few opportunities to go out uh, and walk farmland, forest land with the landowner or operator. And you can really, um, especially if this person is an organic farmer, you can talk to them about enhancing, improving, and maintaining biodiversity on their operation. Um, and and link that to um, how they are then meeting the National Organic Program regulations. Uh, our farmers, as you know, most of our working lands um, have a lot of opportunities for farmers to improve biodiversity. And it can be something useful for them in a systems-based approach of agriculture as organic is that can help uh, control uh, weeds and pests and diseases, as well as improve soil fertility and plant health by the uh, diverse plantings that they would put in. I just want to say, too, that, that farmers typically are good stewards. Many times they live on this piece of property that they are working, and they are very um, emotionally tied to seeing uh, and having a healthy wildlife and ecosystems on their farm. Next. Uh, the other thing, too, is that a conservation professional does not only have to talk about what the farmer can receive cost share uh, practices to, to do on their farms, but, but just you're there and you can help them open their eyes to the opportunities that they have for improvement in biodiversity. So one of those things is you may be on a specialty or horticultural crop farm where they could plant beneficial insect habitat, which Sam will talk about in more greater detail. Um, and of course, the less pest damage, then they have higher yields of higher quality crops. And by using biodiversity, they have less need for purchased inputs and labor for pest control. Next slide. And our livestock operations, there's a lot of opportunities to encourage 
biodiversity, having diverse plantings uh, in pastures, doing rotational grazing where the land has a chance to rest and the grasses grow taller, uh, doing forage harvest after the nesting birds have already fledged out, um, all kinds of uh, different types of livestock operations as well. So it's not only the larger bovines like beef and dairy, but on organic operations, you're going to see hogs and sheep and goats and chickens all out on pasture. Next slide. There's also quite a bit of forest land that can be discussed when you're on a farm. If the, the operator has a woodlot, there's opportunities there uh, to enhance biodiversity. Uh, even if they're not getting cost share for it or not necessarily using it to uh, have further production, but they are gaining recreational benefits. Next slide. Unless, of course, they're doing wild harvest. And up in the upper left-hand corner, you see a uh, maple tree. And I myself have just this morning harvested uh, 90 gallons of sap and boiling it down uh, right now. Of course, I'm not sitting at the stove, but it is boiling itself down, I guess. Um, even echinacea in the Great Plains. Uh, and of course, part of the National Organic Program regulation is that the harvesting of these wild crops would not be destructive to the environment and is done in such a way to sustain the growth and production of the wild crops. Uh, everywhere, I think, across the United States, there's wild berries that could be harvested, uh, morel mushrooms, and other types of mushrooms. In the upper right-hand corner, there's these uh, wild alliums called ramps um, that are harvested. And those can be over-harvested unless you are uh, really paying attention to not um, destroy the resource. And of course, that's ginseng down on the bottom right-hand corner. Next slide. Mostly, we're going to be talking with farmers who are doing uh, agronomic crops. Uh, corn, beans, small grains, uh, lagoons for forage. And there's, there's a lot of opportunity here as well to promote biodiversity, even though those crops tend to be done in larger fields. Next slide. For instance, it's been shown uh, Iowa State has done, uh, Matt Liebman and Matt O'Neill from Iowa State have shown that when there's a more complex agricultural landscape with more field borders and smaller fields, that since there's habitat for more beneficial organisms, they've shown a direct correlation to lowered pest insect problems. Next slide. For instance, here is a chart where they, they actually track that the higher the landscape diversity, the lower the soybean aphid uh, issue was in the fields of soybeans within those fields that had more uh, field borders where beneficial insects and birds could live. Next slide. So there is uh, quite a bit that can be done. Uh, you Farmers can grow uh, cilantro and dill even in annual crops. They don't have to have perennial uh, field borders. They can put something in on an annual basis, even right next to the crops that tend to get pests. Um, I've seen people even interplant cilantro and dill in the field with their broccoli and kale and cauliflower uh, to attract the beneficial pet parasitic wasps that tend to parasitize the cabbage loopers and worms. Um, another thing, too, is to encourage the farmer as you're looking to perhaps leave overwintering sites. Uh, if they've got field borders, to not to maybe um, let them grow up tall in the fall so there's a place for those beneficials to overwinter rather than either cutting it short or even tilling in those field edges. Next slide. And of course, uh, the beneficials come in all shapes and sizes, uh, having bat houses, uh, again, that's a, a, a parasitic wasp that's parasitizing a uh, fly larva. Um, so uh, for livestock operations, it's not only for specialty crops or agronomic, but even livestock operations can benefit from having that beneficial insect habitat, which um, then helps them control their pests on their livestock. And I know farmers who have introduced these parasitic wasps 
onto their farm, and after a few years, uh, they don't need to keep buying in new parasites because they have enough uh, habitat on their farm that they've basically inoculated their environment, and now those parasitic beneficial wasps are reproducing themselves. Next slide. Uh, another aspect uh, that, that can be discussed is integrated pest management, and there is a practice standard with the NRCS, which basically um, has an approach that's somewhat different from the organic approach to pest management. In organic, we uh, must, through the pest control hierarchy, control pests through cultural, biological, and mechanical means, and as a last resort, we can use uh, these approved synthetics. In the IPM standard as it stands now with um, uh, NRCS, uh, there is, is mostly a lessening of the use of toxic materials, which is already happening on an organic farm. So the, our Conservation and Innovation Grant Group has recommended an organic pest management standard, which we hope will be implemented. Now you can go to the next slide. So now I'm going to talk about a variety of conservation practices that can be suggested to organic farmers when you're on the farm. Uh, conservation cover is a very nice one uh, because it really encourages that the farmer put in a diverse planting, something that will have uh, hopefully uh, blooming plants throughout the growing season attracting a wide variety of pollinators as well as predator insects um, in a larger group. Uh, and, and this can be an area where perhaps it's too rocky or sandy to grow crops. You can still have it be a working land for the farmer uh, by having it be habitat for beneficials of all types. Next slide. Prescribed grazing, as I said earlier, uh, by having the animals move through and letting the grasses grow uh, and recover, you get deeper root systems uh, that, and uh, diversity of plantings with legumes and grasses helps improve soil fertility and soil tilth. And again, like I said, it can be for a wide variety of livestock. Uh, the uh, standard 528 does not only say it's for dairy and beef, it could be for, for poultry or, or hogs or sheep or goats. Um, and of course, giving those animals uh, better forage throughout the season, uh, typically you even can get by with less land for your pasture, um, is a benefit to the farmer. So you can see that there's uh, a double benefit, both it improves the productivity of the farmer's uh, crop, which in this case is livestock, it protects from soil erosion, it provides for wildlife food and cover, um, and it improves, improves that vigor with a whole variety of diverse plant species. Next slide. So if you show up at a farm and they have a, a waterway, a spring, a stream, a river, it's, it's a good thing to discuss with them about leaving a riparian herbaceous cover so there's no uh, runoff from the field. And of course, organic farmers are working really hard to improve their soil, uh, their soil, soil tilt, and increasing uh, in organic matter. And the last thing you want to do is see it run down the river. So uh, putting in these uh, riparian herbaceous covers, and of course you could put in um, a diverse planting there, the things that are going to be blooming. And also, we're, we're thinking about birds and insects, but uh, even reptiles can be beneficial um, on an organic farm or on an egg farm. Next slide. Uh, stream habitat improvement. Uh, that's another uh, standard 395 that can be very uh, helpful. It, even if this, let's say this, uh, one of these streams or both are used in a rotational grazing type system, the, there's the, the, the gentle slope uh, allows for the, the livestock to go up to the creek and drink water. And because they're being moved uh, every day or so, then they're not going to damage that stream bank. 
Um, but this also helps if there is flooding that um, that, that that flooding will um, not be uh, as as widespread because it's a wide floodplain there for the stream to um, spread out when there's more water going through it. And of course, you can see the riprap as well can be very useful. Next slide. So here's an example of a before and an after. Uh, something like this. So the farmer can definitely see that they are getting much more production out of that area. Uh, obviously, it's uh, protecting from soil erosion. Uh, the cattle are still having access to that water, but the animals are being moved regularly, so the soil is not being um, eroded. And, and like I said, obviously, it's much more productive for the farmer as well as healthier for the animal. Next slide. Uh, there's a practice standard 643, which is the restoration and management of declining habitats. Now, there may not be uh, a lot of production benefits from this, but like I said, the farmers many times live right there on their land. Uh, they really do enjoy seeing wildlife, especially uh, certain kinds of wildlife. I know where I live, the bobolinks are uh, somewhat in decline. Um, and when we see them, we, we just feel that we are being good land stewards. Um, of course, though, if there are flowering plants, then you're going to have those beneficial insects living there as well. And of course, there are people, too, that may decide to rent out land for hunting, let's say uh, in the Great Plains look for pheasants or, or whatever. And so any time that you can improve a declining habitat, it, it, it does have a benefit to the landowner. Next slide. Uh, wetlands as well uh, can be uh, something uh, beneficial. Again, extra income if there are ducks uh, coming and landing. Um, I know quite a few farmers who do allow hunting, and then they get a little stipend from the, farm, the person who's renting that. Um, but it's not to say that it would only be one kind of duck. A whole variety of waterfowl can be um, encouraged, um, as well as, I imagine, um, uh, reptiles. Next slide. Uh, even uh, upland wildlife, uh, deer and, and bluebird houses. Um, this, the farmer can graze or hay this land. Uh, but it still must retain herbaceous cover, and I believe there is a um, requirement to let the birds fledge out, so this just would be a late season haying. Um, even in this area, they can plant food plots to enhance and expand those wildlife populations. And, and this is something that they, their families, their friends, or they can rent it out, you know, to help for other people to hunt. But this is uh, kind of a, a, a pretty big issue. There's less and less people who have access to land, and so the people who are controlling the land, um, if they could be encouraged to enhance the, the uh, habitat for wildlife, it benefits everyone. Next slide. Uh, another uh, practice standard is the wetland restoration uh, area. And a lot of farmers have kind of a low end on some of their fields. Um, that just tend to flood, you know, three years out of four. Um, just having a discussion that perhaps if they restore that to wetland, um, then they are getting the benefits of wetlands, which are, of course, wildlife habitat, recreation, and water quality protection, especially since they weren't getting any crops out of that land anyway. Next slide. Okay, that's me, Sam Urcho. Thank you, Harriet. Um, no, we're not looking at a deer there. Um, here's a candid shot of me as a TSP in the field working with scientific precision to locate the site for a new hedgerow. Um, it does illustrate, though, how working with farmers in the field is at the heart of the planning process. Next slide. <clears throat> um, we have many functions of these conservation plantings, hedgerows, grass waterways, filter strips, riparian plantings, windbreaks, all of these actually play a role in carbon sequestration, which helps with the issue of climate change. The specific functions of these plantings are soil erosion control, weed control, beneficial insect and pollinator habitat, 
wildlife habitat, non-point source water pollution reduction, air quality and dust control, barriers, riparian stabilization, windbreak and climate modification, aesthetic value, economic returns, and increase in local and regional biodiversity. Next. This slide shows a form that I use when I go out in the field with a farmer. It has just general information. It always helps to have a map and an aerial photo and just to write down, to ask these questions. What are the goals of these of the planting, specifically size, length, height of the species, special consideration, talk about irrigation, weed strategies, and the actual physical planting of it. The three elements that I um, that apply to me as a TSP are design, implementation, and checkout. Okay, next slide. Um, we plant many plants in hedgerows, so we get a flowering period over one year, over the course of a year, so that the insects which use pollen and nectar will have that, it, as well as they also use the plants for cover. Next. This is a slide showing just a study that was done in California on se several plant species and showing the beneficial insects that actually came to those. And we've used this information to base the, the use of native California plants in our hedgerows. Next. These are some slides of some of the beneficial insects, a spider in the middle of a minute pirate bug, a lady ladybug larvae on the right, another spider, and then a ladybug. Next. The surfid fly on the top left is the heart of the organic lettuce industry. Basically, it's a lacewing larvae on the right. There's a green lacewing down on the left, and these are damselflies, nabids on the bottom right. And wasps, next, the wasps periodically or routinely will lay their eggs on the plants. Those are mummified aphids up on the right that have been, uh, wasps have laid their eggs in. Next. This slide shows the visits of wasps to these different hedgerow plants over from June to October over the bottom. And you can see one plant, the coyote brush, really had a lot of visitors, but nevertheless, the other plants equally were visited by wasps. Next slide. This shows the lacewing visits, and this, this illustrates why having a variety of of species is really good. A single species would only attract some, and you also have um, sometimes survival problems with a single species, so having a mix of species is really important. Next, we have owl boxes that we use that um, attract owls. Next, this is um, a, 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 he was a shop teacher in Merced Steve Simmons, and he would use discarded raisin plywood drying pieces of wood to build nest boxes for the students who built a, a scholarship fund for their college. And we were on a field day and he crawled up this ladder and he pulls a little barn owl out of the box and then he pulled these two little baby barn owls and then the last one he pulls a gopher out. So they are very effective with um, helping to manage rodents. Next slide. Birds also are very important and they they can be problematic. N nothing is a silver bullet in any of this, but um, birds are, are well known to control lots of insects. At the turn of the century, universities had departments of economic ornithology, and they would study the stomachs of birds, and they found all kinds of um, pest insects that were being eaten by these insects, by these birds, sorry. Next slide. Um, Pollination is a is a very important part of habitat creation on the farms, and we get a lot of bumblebees, native bees, as well as hunting be honeybees come to these plants. Next, um, they're well known to increase yields, and so it's a it's a and NRCS has a special category for pollinator hedgerows. Actually, okay, next slide. We're going to run down some of the some of the specific practices that I work with. Here's a hedgerow that we planted and the, the, far, the farmer is an almond and organic cotton and organic almond farmer and he pays to have these hives brought in and because of that hedgerow you can see it in the background. Um, he was, the, the beekeeper was getting 
lots of the bees were staying around a lot longer so he reduced the cost to the farmer by basically eight thousand dollars it was so here was a kind of unexpected benefit of having a hedgerow next this is um, this hedgerow shows a conservation practice that can help organic farmers address multiple areas of the National Organic Pro Program rule. This farmer was most interested in the beneficial insect uh, aspect of this, but he also was interested in a barrier and dust control and um, and erosion control and diversity in his perennial system. He has an orchard on one side and vegetables on the other. Next slide. Um, this is just showing, a, this is actually that same farm on the right, the arrow on the right is a hedgerow that runs all along the side of his road as you come in and then on the left, this is a windbreak towards the back where he was, he, the strong winds come off from the left and it also um, provides beneficial insects and other features. Okay, next. This is a this is the, actually a, a close up of the same windbreak, and he was providing a buffer between his neighbor. Um, we try to use mainly native plants. These are redwoods, and uh, we used incense cedar and giant sequoias and some non-native plants. But traditionally, eucalyptus and castorina have been used, and redwoods have been found to be a quite a effective. Uh, species and I'm sure in each area you can find trees that are that are well suited to windbreaks that are native to the area. Next slide. This is just showing how habitat can be created where once there was nothing. This is a very sterile landscape up on the left and we created habitat here. Um, the farmer has a, a scout who comes around and looks for insects and he found a coyote nest, a den, actually underneath with the coyote brush with little baby coyotes in it and he also jumped out of his skin when a gopher snake stared him in the face when he was crawling around looking at uh, plants but this is just a great example of bringing habitat into areas and diversifying the farm. Next slide. Here is a picture looking upstream and downstream from the same site and how riparian plantings can really obviously change the nature of an area and bring in so much biodiversity as opposed to the sterility of just these scraped bare ditches. Then this is a drainage ditch in the Central Valley of California. Next slide. This is another picture that was taken looking upstream and downstream from the same site. The uh, upstream is just typical erosion in the Salinas Valley and downstream this was plant seeded. We used seeds to plant native perennial grasses and then we put a hedgerow along the edge. So these are again two practice standards within our CS. Next slide is um, a sheep ranch that we're currently working on where the uh, farmer wants to provide areas of shade for the sheep. So those red lines going across are going to be, they're all going to be oak trees and shrubs. The bare field is just a picture of it on the left. So that's a Again, this is using for the uh, conservation practice for the National Organic Program rule. It's it's this shade and shelter for livestock. Next slide is showing again a hedgerow that was put in as a buffer zone from dust pollution. This road you can see to the right and in the aerial photo it's along the top trucks and cars go by there and you can see clouds of dust coming up and blowing onto his field. This hedgerow grew up very quickly and it's a, it's a great habitat for beneficial insects as well as definitely cutting down on the dust that comes in. Next slide. This slide shows a, a berm between a, a road and a field. It's a very common landscape feature for farms and this farmer didn't want tall plants. We put short plants in short shrubs. There's varieties you can get from the nurseries that are both tall and short of our native plants and I'm sure that's equally available anywhere in the country. Um, we also put yarrow and some yarrow and deer grass in there so we had a variety and this created habitat for beneficial insects and 
also he didn't have to weed this. This was a weed issue for him where he would have to take care of the weeds and also it was a weed source for the crops. Next slide. This is a riparian planting um, where the farmer is a walnut farmer and he's getting biodiversity in perennial walnuts as well as beneficial insects and erosion control on the bank of this creek, big creek that he has and it's um, again a conservation practice that addresses multiple areas of the National Organic Program rule. Next slide please. This is another riparian area. You can see the riverbed in the aerial photo there on the right and the farmer took a significant amount of land off and we have a, a, the young planting down the left you can see is shrubs on the inside towards the field and trees on the outside and this grew up very rapidly and is forming a very nice riparian forest zone right now with many attributes. Next slide, filter strips is something that we do quite a bit of and they have many diverse uses, erosion control being the main one. Um, next slide. This is a picture of a filter strip on next to a field. The filter strip is a, a strip of perennial grasses there and there's a hedgerow on the right. Next slide. This is a, another filter strip that this this field had there was serious erosion would come off of this roadway. It's all dirt road and the you get these wide erosion channels through that area there so we came in with plugs we used we grew them from seed ourselves actually and um, planted them out and the next year it came up and there was it actually stopped the erosion it was quite stunning for us I mean it, supposedly it really works and it did it stopped the erosion and we're doing a lot more of these on this same farm next slide this is a, a typical eroding ditch in the Salinas Valley and we went in with plugs and that picture down on the left is actually six months after the planting it grew up very rapidly and it's helping to control the the, the erosion and the sediment removal. Next slide shows the root structure of perennial grasses versus annual grasses and these perennials are really very well suited to our climate they can die down a little bit in the summertime but the roots still stay active and then in the winter they come back and these roots are very effective for spreading the soil. There's there's lots of different native grasses that we can choose from and it, they've, they've become very good. The next slide shows a project that we did again in the Salinas Valley on the USDA research station in Salinas. This was a problem eroding ditch up there on the left top. We went in and they they graded back the, the, the land, a, a V-shaped ditch is, is not as effective as a U-shaped ditch, so that's kind of a, a U-shaped ditch there. We used drip tape, we did this with seed, and then put rice straw on the top. Rice straw doesn't carry the weeds that we'll find in other kinds of straw. And then on the bottom right is what it looked like just a few months later. It's a, it's a very effective thing. We did put sediment little sediment basins at the top because these these ditches can fill up with sand when when silt is, and sand are coming in but and it it's been very there were weeds at the beginning but it's been very successful at choking out the weeds um, next slide just shows some resources you can go on to the the webinar and get these the, there's an ATRA farmscaping publication there next slide and that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, this is Joanne again. Um, so conservation planners can help the farmer address biodiversity and natural resource conservation through um, many other kinds of practice standards like this alley cropping. And um, these standards, these practices help, um, the, help the farm and they also help the larger landscape. So alley cropping helps a farmer in perennial systems incorporate biodiversity. Um, and the left picture shows, it shows a black walnut orchard. And um, by adding row crops underneath, it um, includes or increases biodiversity, which is part of the NOP's regulation. 
Um, it also helps that row crop then helps cover the soil and prevent erosion and it helps the farm to diversify its income, which is always a good thing. Next. So what about wildlife as a food safety concern? Well, in FDA's proposed produce rules that were published this January, um, in their preamble they say that they acknowledge that, um, that when produce is grown in an outdoor environment, wild animals are likely to have access to production fields and that the presence of those animals in and of itself is not a significant food safety risk. Next. Um, so what they are proposing to require is that the farmer monitor the crop both while it's growing and especially right before harvest and they're monitoring for crop damage and animal feces and if they find um, either or, and or a large number of animals continually in the crop, they um, then suggest that the farmer do something to manage that. If there's animal feces, for instance, and or crop damage, the um, farmer wouldn't harvest right there. They would um, cordon that piece off. So the FDA also says that they don't require measures that, that would exclude animals from um, outdoor growing areas like fencing or and they don't require the destruction of habitat like they like clearing farm borders or um, areas that uh, convey water. Next. So the, the diversion ditch can help a farmer who's addressing, who needs to address food safety issues. For instance, if there's livestock grazing on a patch pasture above a row crop field, they can put in a diversion ditch that, that diverts water coming off the, that pasture that may have pathogens and uh, keep that away from the crop. Likewise, diverting water can address the NOP's requirement for um, keeping unintended materials not um, approved for organic off a uh, production field. Next. There are practices that help a farm um, address the conservation of aquatic species, such as putting in uh, micro irrigation. So the farm um, is conserving water uh, for the benefit of the farm, but also the benefit of wild nature. And uh, by doing that, they are keeping the water in a narrow strip so there's less weeds and um, better management. Next. Prescribed, pre prescribed burning is a tool that organic farm or organic range um, land can um, use when uh, there are problems with diseases or stim or the f the um, producer wants to stimulate seed germination. That said, burning um, cannot be used in all capacities. For instance, the NOP does not allow the disposal of crop residues by burning. Next. Rangeland can be planted with native grasses to provide forage for livestock and for wildlife. And that diversifies up the perennial system. Um, you can obviously um, cover the soil better uh, with um, thoughtful plantings that then address erosion control, can support beneficial insects, and just increase um, uh, uh, habitat for wildlife. Next. Herbaceous weed control is a practice that can help farmers deal with invasive weeds, which is uh, something that NOP um, would like to see addressed. And these um, weeds like Arondo Dunlax, when removed, get, leave room for important native habitat that can support lots of different kinds of wildlife. Next. Specifically, there's uh, efforts going on that NRCS is um, um, behind helping to take out pinion juniper 
species in rangelands so that it improves grazing for animals and at the same time provides much better habitat for a sage grouse, which is in decline. Next. Landslide treatment is a practice standard that can help organic farmers in certain situations, like with this willow planting, where it helped to stabilize the soil and at the same time can provide habitat for lots of organisms. Next. Um, putting in a pond and creating wetlands helps to um, address water storage issues on, on and uh, support wildlife. The situation on this farm was there's water coming off the hills in the background and just going through the farm uh, really quickly. And so by creating these practices, the farmer was able to capture that water, which can use then later on in the summer and um, at the same time provide some really quality habitat. Next. Wetland restoration also can help with um, the farm. Uh, the wetlands help to filter pollutants. They provide stepping stones for migratory birds as well as all kinds of food cover and nesting habitat for multiple species. Wetlands, um, we have seen uh, lots of literature that shows wetlands can help filter pathogens, so they're important uh, these days with uh, so much concern around food safety. Next. Constructed wetlands uh, also help deal with effluent that could be coming out of a organic operation, specifically an uh, organic handling operation. There, there are four um, kinds of operations that the NOP addresses. There's crop, livestock, wild harvest, and handling operations. And often the handling operations are, are um, left out of the picture, but in fact, when they do have processing affluent uh, coming out of their, their operations, it would be great um, for op these operations to work with NRCS to uh, address that before it leaves the farm. So a lot of the practices we talked about are described in more detail and linked to the National Organic Program rules. If you'd uh, like to look through the guide, Biodiversity Conservation Organic Farmers Guide, you can download it here uh, at wildfarmalliance.org. Thanks. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you, uh, Sam and Harriet. Um, Dana, are, I'm not sure if Dana is present or not, but uh, if you are, yes. you can speak up. Yes, I'm Hello, here. Dana. Okay, Dana, I just wanted to make sure um, that you're there. So we're going to start with some questions. You can you can keep uh, typing them in away there on your chat. We ha we have a few. Um, the first one I'm going to start with, I think, was early on, Joanne, and probably you can start with it. I'm sure all of you, I know Harriet knows about standards. I think there was some, some confusion in your talking about perennial and monoculture, and there was a misunderstanding. I think that at least one of the, the viewers uh, thought that you were suggesting that, that uh, perennial crop systems um, are not certifiable, but um, and she asked, for instance, like, you know, can't you certify an alfalfa stand even, even though you know, it may not be permanent in the perennial sense, but but um, but but we are certainly have orchards and other things. So maybe I think she was getting at some issues around the need for annual crops to be rotated. I think in organic systems. Um, That's right. The um, ro crop rotation definition says for annual crops that there must be rotations, but in for perennial crops where you obviously can't rotate. Um, in lieu of rotations, they suggest uh, that there's alley cropping or hedgerows or some other kind of diversity is brought into the farm. Uh -huh. that, that's very helpful. I think that's the point. Anyone else want to comment? Or I, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks. Um, in general, um, you know, we talked, you talked originally about 
working land versus um, uh, uh, you know these perennial systems or permanent hedgerows. I think the 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 person was getting at a little bit on. Obviously, when you start to take land out of production and put it into hedgerows and other purposes, which have some both environmental and other benefits, clearly, there is also possibly some economic losses and kind of gains. And the question was, have there been any very much study of you know the the net economic benefits of some of this? Um, obviously, erosion and things, but you know, in terms of the immediate benefit of giving up that land in a sense for production. Well, um, I'll address part of that. There's been several instances of landlords actually reducing the acreage rent for farmers by taking some land back from some of the edges. Um, but there, and I think your question about have there been economic studies of that, I'm not sure of that. But the the way you hear about there be economic values is a lot of farmers actually are able to reduce uh, the the insecticides that they use because of the increase in beneficial insects and then the the economic benefits of not having to move soil around that's actually eroded out onto a road so where these practices can prevent significant soil movement that's an economic thing so there must be some studies out there I'm not aware of them um, I again I'm not aware of the actual economic studies but I um, in relation to the, the acreage of a hedgerow versus it, you know, um, what you could have made from the crop. But I do know that some kinds of crops benefit from pollination, pollination better than others. And for instance, a blueberry crop um, benefits from wild pollinators much more than they do uh, honeybees. So by providing habitat that supports um, honeybees, I mean, supports wild pollinators, we're able to um, then bring in those uh, important species and, and have better uh, pollination. Harriet, did you have anything to add? Well, I wish there was more research done on this. I, I do know that um, it's really hard to economically quantify the dollars, you know, it's kind of like the old Joni Mitchell song, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Um, so it's, although we all know that honeybees are very important for pollinating, but how much research has there been to know what about those native pollinators, the, the solitary bees, the mason bees, what are they um, contributing? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have a lot of research on that. I do know that Anecdotally, I've had, especially vegetable producers, talk to me about um, the, the loss of habitat when they start to clear out their field edges, that they notice that they have more uh, problems with rodents because there's no place for the hawks and owls to perch. So, you know, we have that. And, and there is some work being done, like I said, at Iowa State concerning those field edges and having habitat that there is less damage from soybean aphids on those soybeans growing in those smaller fields. But I don't know how much it's been tied to economic benefit or not. Also, um, windbreaks are known to help increase yields. And as I mentioned in my slide, the uh, farmer got quite an economic boost from having the, the hedgerows providing habitat for his beehives. There was a a study done in California last year looking at the difference between growing a hedgerow on the edge of a farm versus just allowing weeds to grow there and these, these uh, this study was done next to tomato fields and what they found was those weeds would produce seeds really quickly which then supported quite a few pests that live in tomatoes and so um, as opposed to hedgerows where those insect pests weren't attracted because there weren't a lot of seeds for them. Um, and so in that sense, it was a, a real benefit. Thanks. Um, this is probably related, so maybe you don't have to go again, but uh, maybe this is another example. Uh, 
uh, uh, one of the one of the viewers obviously has has has, has built a pond and has a pond and and is using that for a lot of a lot of purposes on the farm but it but it also says he attracts the Canadian geese and he he's a horticulture especially crop grower and the geese do cause economic damage so I guess he's trying to make the point that it's not always a necessarily a win-win situation I mean what I guess speaking to that I guess I guess again um, animals could and I guess maybe this comes to even in, in terms of of uh, food safety issues they they can cause economic losses as well so again just another comment from uh, a, a participant right that's true I mean uh, mostly when uh, there is some kind of economic damage a farmer will deal with the that um, wildlife um, before there is any kind of food safety issue I mean as as opposed to just waiting to try and determine if, oh, you know, I better be concerned about food safety. It kind of goes hand in hand. If you're seeing damage, yes, then you should think about food safety and deal with that. So, um, yeah, geese here in California, they've done lots of studies but looking at E. coli and uh, salmonella and haven't found any in geese, but I think um, across the the world, in some areas, uh, geese have been found to, to carry small amounts of pathogens. So, yeah, it really depends on the specific area that you're in, and then um, the ideal thing is to try and discourage them as much as possible without doing much harm to the species. Right. Well, the other side too is is if there's an overabundance of their coming out of their kind of wildlife area into your field then the, you know we're out of balance again and it's kind of hard to say you know where what are the predators why why is there such a concentration right there that they're becoming a pest we're always doing that dance of trying to find the balance um, in our between the wildlife and our crop growing in our ecosystems between predator and pest insects and that sort of thing. So almost anything that can become a pest uh, in, in when it's beyond its usual threshold or, um, uh, you know, if it's out of balance with the predators. And of course, you know, if you look at our whole planet, we, we've got a lot of balancing act improvement to do. <laughs> Good point, Harriet. Um... There was an, a little bit of a, conf I think maybe it goes to speaking about just what a practice standard is, and, and, and maybe Dana can even come in here. Um, but they, they were, uh, one of the viewers, uh, the attendees was looking at that very before and after of the stream habitat, the improvement, the practice standard 395. And she seemed to be suggest seemed to be misunderstanding. It seems to me from the question that she said, "Well, what what can you do? You know, what other practices can you do to get that after situation to occur?" And uh, and I think the implication was is that the practice standard like 395 was certainly part of that before and after picture, but maybe she's talking about other other things to do that you know that can 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 improve that, or maybe I think it is that I think she may be getting at something like. Uh, the the um, kind of depth of what a practice standard is because sometimes it, 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 she, I think right. she was and just confused. Right, and many times practices are done uh, almost you know in groups. So uh, I mean, I did not work on that farm, but uh, you know, perhaps they applied for and received some cost share for forage and biomass planting, uh, rotational grazing to maintain. Um, so so there would be cover on that land obviously they were using that pasture as a permanent pasture at some point and then it was being used a lot uh, more ecologically afterwards so to, yes to get to that part there could have been some fencing uh, planting uh, management all those things go together um, to to have that great improvement that we saw in the second picture on the bottom Um, here's one definitely for, for Dana. Um, uh, I, obviously, somebody is concerned about the topic of sequestration, and and there's somebody is wondering whether NRCS funding in general is in jeopardy because of the uh, 
the current budgetary sequestration. Dana, are you there? <laughs> What's happening with the uh, funding for availability for like EQIP and, and other and CSP programs uh, in terms of the sequestration issue? Uh, can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, our agency, like a lot of agencies, have been uh, has been affected by this sequestration. Um, if you want any specific details, you have to go through our public affairs folks. But we've been um, uh, we've had some cutbacks, and uh, we're just uh, we're just waiting to see what happens uh, through Congress, like everybody else. A lot of folks are doing uh, double duty and so forth. So. Um, we just have, we're just waiting to see what's going to happen. Thank you. Um, here's one that's a, I'm trying to, I'm struggling a bit um, to, does, uh, I'll read it. Does NRCS help farmers when the state prohibits livestock from using a pond that was created for erosion control. I'm not really familiar with this situation. And he says, Washington State and Oregon claim eminent domain on any water that stands or travels through a property. Um, has this been an issue in terms of implementing some of these kinds of practices? Does anyone have a shot at that? <laughs> Dana, maybe? I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with Washington State's uh, right. laws and requirements, but uh, NRCS, uh, when we implement conservation practices, we need to follow also state laws and requirements. So er every state has a different uh, take on that. And uh, so TSPs in particular need to be aware of what those pr particular state laws and requirements are when they're working with landowners. That's, that's all I can really say about that topic. Okay. Any, I don't know, maybe in California there's not similar kinds of um, issues. Not, not that I know of. Yeah. Um, uh, this is interesting because I do work in the, on biochar, but I don't know if you, if any of you guys have used it, but somebody asked about whether there's any cost, um, incentives or cost share for applying biochar, which has been starting to be shown to uh, help so soil retain moisture and some other positive properties. Uh, has anyone had experience with that? I my, myself, I have. I I know that there's some some possibilities there. I I'm pretty sure I know of no uh, NRCS practices that uh, that have yet moved to uh, encouraging biochar, but it seems that um, it's a growing interest. Um, anyone want to comment on that? It's a bit out of the yeah, out I of know, the. I know that it, it is used in California. Mm -hmm. I know the uh, one of the vineyards really like biochar, but I don't see a lot of use here currently in the upper Midwest where I'm located. Uh, uh, I think um, I think that's about it for now. Um, I think I think we pretty much covered that there. Um, um, I would thank everyone again. Um, uh, there was, I want to make a point. Uh, I make a point that the, this webinar and the other three that were in this set are definitely on the Atra site under our video uh, section. If you come to the thing, so you see that www.atra.ncat.org. All of these organizations will um, could be linking to them on their respective websites. You can always call our one eight hundred number to find out about getting copies. So I know a lot of people have said they were going fast and they couldn't keep up writing down their notes, but you can you can view these. Uh, forever on, on 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 our web off of our website, um, and um, and we encourage that. Uh, we have been working with NRCS nationally to get some of these also connected to their TSP site. Um, I know some of them are up there, and uh, NRCS has gone through a change in their website recently. So we'll make sure we can have these available for folks. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, just feel free to call us, and and we can get you in touch with um, and get you answers to to all of these questions. Any any last comments by other folks? Nope. Thank you right. for listening. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good afternoon, or I guess it is afternoon for everyone now. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.